Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Lisa. This is episode 38 of week eight, and we are about to go into a long weekend. It is just about Memorial Day. It is beautiful out, and we're expecting a beautiful weekend. But what's different about today and this week and this year? And that's that we're not going anywhere. Usually we're asking everybody, where are you going? Where are you staying? What are you doing? What's up for the long weekend? And this year I am working in my garden. And why is that? Because it's pandemic year and we're all wondering, when do we get to start traveling again? When do we get to go back to our favorite hotel and sit outside and sit by the pool and be around other people? Maybe there's that favorite bar at that favorite resort and, you know, we're all starting to really miss it. And I'm dying to find out when can we go back to hotels and what are we going to experience? So thank you for joining us today live on YouTube. And today we have Cameron Sperance. And Cameron is the hospitality reporter for the online travel, uh, excuse me, the online business travel and hospitality publication called Skipped. And today Cameron's gonna talk to us about what is happening with hotels, what are we going to see? What are we going to start to anticipate? And I don't know about you, but I am ready to go. I am ready with my passport. I am ready with my bag. See this, Cameron? This is ready to go. I do. <laughs> and you promised me that yep. you would tell me where I can take it. Yes. Thank yes. you for joining me. Cameron and I got to know each other when he was a commercial real estate reporter at BizNow. And, uh, where you were working for years covering anything and everything going on in the industry, but your real passion is travel and everything related, right? Hospitality, uh, hotels, restaurants, even what's going on in the air airlines right now, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And when the opportunity uh, came knocking a couple of months ago, decided to take the switch and uh, go full time for travel and hotels and having a good time doing well, it, I love despite it. everything going on. So say that again. Saying having a great time doing it, despite uh, certainly a, a different travel environment than expected at the beginning of the so year. So I do remember when you said you were going over to Skift, and it was right as the pandemic was just barely starting. At that point, we weren't even sure if we'd be out of work for two weeks or months. And I said, are you sure this is what you want to do? And you're like, oh, yeah. And so tell us about Skift and tell us about what you're covering. Definitely. I mean, Skift is a company we really want to be the homepage for the travel industry and all its players mm -hmm. every morning, afternoon, night as well. Um, and but also too, I mean, just anyone remotely interested in travel, it's really the place to be. Mm -hmm. I am lucky enough to be the hospitality reporter, so focusing a lot on um, just the big brands, the small brands, the independent players in hospitality right now, and. Obviously, this very, it, it's getting overused, but unprecedented time we find ourselves in and how they're going to rebuild and hopefully find some opportunities on the on the other side of this. Sure. I know my team has some of your uh, favorite articles they'll be posting in the chat for those who are watching live. And of course, that's the benefit of watching live is being part of the chat and engaging with us, asking questions. So we always encourage questions. Uh, what are some of the things that you're starting to see? Because I've been reading Skift and I've been reading about all these new changes to the hotels that are taking this opportunity to renovate and you know re redesign out their spaces. So what are you seeing? Right now, I mean, we're still pretty much in survival mode. And mm -hmm. what a lot of these big companies and small players too really want to do is regain your trust and show mm -hmm. that there's really no safer place in the world to be right now than a hotel. Um, so yes, some different properties around the world have temporarily suspended operations just because that was sort of the best decision for them from a business right. standpoint. You're seeing some owners and operators take that time to renovate properties. Um, we can get that get to that in a minute, but first what they're really wanting to do is roll out new standards of cleaning, new standards of social distancing, just mm -hmm. to show to you that when you check in all the way to check out, like you are safe and above all can trust that like your favorite brand is just as much the place to be loyal to as it was 90 days ago or even longer. Right. And the safest place to be. So what would be some of those examples? If I go to check in one of my favorite places, Chatham Bars Inn on Cape Cod, what, what for example, would I expect if I went to ch check in at any of the hotels? I would say pretty standard is you're going to see um, 
a lot of notes of keeping at least six feet away from other guests, a mm -hmm. lot of distancing between employees and guests too. Yeah. A lot of people in PPE, masks, gloves. Um, a lot of the bigger companies are pushing contactless check-ins. So mm -hmm. use your Marriott Bonvoy app, Marriott, uh, your Hilton Honors app as well to basically 24 hours before you arrive, they'll send you a map of the hotel. You pick your room, um, you check in, they send you a digital key and you don't even have to use those room key cards that we had. And it's, I, I think you're going to see a lot of further innovations in that place um, as well. Wait, Kim, let's hold on. So almost like if I'm picking my airline seat, you're telling me that I will be able to pick my room in Absolutely. the hotel? Yeah, it, it's, we're seeing, or sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> can I upgrade myself for free? It, it's funny. I had the exact same question. Uh, Hilton CEO Chris Massetta was discussing that, and I, I didn't quite get the answer to it. So watch <laughs> the space. We'll, we'll be doing a uh, investigation into that. I'd like waterfront view. <laughs> I know. I, I was immediately thinking it'd be nice to get that presidential villa at Encore Boston Harbor uh, <laughs> for what you're paying for a standard one, uh, a queen size room. So everything will be on the app. Like, what else will be on the app? That's amazing. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, Hilton's where I'm hearing the most out of the space. They launched a program called Connected Room in late 2017. It's been sort of in uh, kind of a, the test mode the last couple of years. Um, and Chris Nassetta was saying this is really turning it into more of a necessity. So you'll see right. everything from the lamps to room temperature, remote control, um, ordering room service through this, and the staff will just knock and drop is what they're calling it uh, for your room. So you're really not going to interact much in the near term with hotel staff. Um, and, and so it's it's pretty exciting. Um, we'll see how much of this becomes a permanent landscape because sure. I, I was thinking he was discussing the app, but also a week before they announced that they're partnering with the Mayo Clinic and the maker of Lysol to really focus on these areas so you could touch a remote control and not feel like that hasn't mm -hmm. been Windex or, or Lysol, sorry. All right. So another question though, how would I tip people? I think one of the few times that I have cash and small denominations on me is when I'm staying in a hotel so I can be tipping people along the way. How will that work? Have they figured that out? A lot of that's going to actually happen through the app as well. And I, I've heard of a couple of smaller players. Actually, that's one of the first things that they've thought of is finding a way for you to tip the bartender, tip, you know, housekeeping, et cetera, all through an app. So I, I think it's definitely in its infancy, but probably by year's end, I would expect this to be a pretty well-oiled machine. That's amazing. I'm thinking that the end of cash is pretty near. It was already on its decline and now nobody wants to touch cash. So yeah. That's fascinating. Of some of the hotels that are doing major renovations, I've heard of things like taking carpet out of bedrooms, uh, which I actually love that. I always thought that carpet in the bedroom was pretty gross. Um, anything else like that that you're hearing from the people that are taking this time for the major renovations? It's interesting where I've heard the most come from is it's been pretty well reported. The Four Seasons, we did an article about this. Four Seasons in New York, um, owned by Ty Warner. They've done a really um, impressive job of shutting down the facility and turning it over to doctors and nurses working at some mm -hmm. nearby hospitals. And when I've talked to that team, they've really discussed how it kind of, it's not going to be just a turn the lights back on to normal guests. Like they're going to have to take mm -hmm. some time to really do a deep clean and then maybe do some capital expenses, uh, investments rather in the property ahead of reopening. And mm -hmm. so they've thought about like, what do they do with wallpaper? What do they do with all this upholstery? And I think that's going to extend to a lot of these other brands. Because like you said, I mean, the, the carpeting was a little um, of the gross side. Uh, it had the, the odds were in your favor of maybe ending up on Dateline with one of those blue light uh, wow. investigation pieces. So yeah, maybe more hardwood and tile coming to your favorite hotel. You know, you think about all of the textures and uh, fabrics that they would put into hotel rooms. And now... It'll be very interesting. I'm hoping that it's not a sterile experience. I hope that it's still this beautiful, luxurious experience. You know, we have a few questions on the side. Do you have a prediction for local travel industry this summer? I think um, it's definitely going to be drive to, um, mm -hmm. which I mean, that bodes well for New England. Uh, I, I was talking to Lark Hotels and they said something, which is a 
smaller operator, they have hotels on the Cape, Nantucket, uh, up in Portland, Maine. Mm -hmm. And they were saying every one of their properties in New England is within at most a six hour drive of 56 million people. So I think wow. the Northeast uh, travel operators are going to do pretty fair uh, through all of this just because there's such a built-in local regional domestic traveler base here right. so um i think it's a good time to explore our own backyard and just kind of maybe go a state over rather than a country over but where does that become a challenge because i'm thinking you're you're on today from provincetown which is such a fabulous uh little town at the very tip of cape cod and it takes a long time to get there if you're driving from boston or a quick ferry ride over but that's a very quiet place most of the year and you're fairly safe and secluded, but in the summertime, it is tourist central and it is not known for distancing. It is known for lots of people on the streets and packed bars. And I know that the residents of Provincetown are a little concerned. So what about towns like Provincetown or, or any area in the world that is a big summer hotspot? How do you prepare for that? Or what are you anticipating? To be honest, it's, it's still a big question mark here. Mm -hmm. uh, there is still a little bit of uncertainty from how hotels, restaurants are expected to reopen, what the timeline for reopening is here. Um, I'm lucky my barber is reopening on Monday, so we at least we at least know that's coming down the line. But uh, no, there is a major uh, question mark regarding how do some of the Massachusetts's hot spots for travel reopen. I, I know here for Memorial Day, they are not really wanting non-essential travel to come here. So the parking lots are closed unless you're a resident. Mm -hmm. I've heard other municipalities in the area are doing the same until at least we clear this long um, holiday weekend coming about. When we do reopen, I, I think you're going to see a lot more push for outdoor dining, uh, mm -hmm. shutting down main roads for cars so you can socially distance. A lot of the dining rooms here are pretty small. So you're, you're going to have to rely on outdoor seating or take kind of a revenue cut because you just can't have last year's capacities. Um, yeah. I also know the good thing about P-Town is we do have a lot of nightlife. We do have a lot of kind of big events. They pretty much closed, canceled all of that for this year. So it, it's a, kind of the adage is make uh, big memories, but small crowds. So you're oh. not going to have carnival. You're not going to have bear week or things like that. But uh, the restaurants should be still open at some point. I was a huge fan of the karaoke at the Governor Bradford, so I will certainly miss that this year. Uh, as a part-time resident, that goes all year round, Lisa, so you can do that in December just as easily as you can in July. <laughs> okay, good to know. We can work our number uh, between now and then. I might be more apt to get up and do karaoke in the wintertime than I will be in the summertime. <laughs> you and I, me both. I, I have always known, no matter how many cocktails I had in the Governor Bradford, that it was not a good idea for me to get up and sing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I expect a Fiona Apple number out of you uh, in the next couple of months. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> have you listened to this voice, Cameron? Have you seen how raspy that is? There's no range. Um, we can work our harmonies. Um, so do you, what about national travel? And I have someone on the side saying they really want international travel. Is anybody traveling internationally? What do you, I mean, there are deals out there. There are huge deals. So what do you think? I, I think it's a little too early to make the call for international. And I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, you're, I, I know, I know um, you're beginning to see the, the one thing that kind of breaks my heart is Logan airport in Boston has added all those international flights in the last couple of years. And yeah. a lot of the ones that were announced for this year aren't coming online. You're seeing some of the players at or airlines add flights back later in June, definitely in July, you get, for a city Boston size, it's still enough to brag about. Um, we'll see. I, I, the only model we really have to run off right now is how China has reopened. And mm -hmm. they had their, what they call Labor Day holiday. It was the first weekend in May. And the numbers have been incredible. Um, Hyatt was talking about how they sold out properties on Hainan wow. Island. And that was a fly to destination. That wasn't drive to. And people have been saying like fly to transit travel, is it's going to take months. And the first opportunity that people in China had, they booked it to this island, hopped on a plane. Um, I, I don't think people are as resistant to hop on an airplane collectively as we might think. Um, but we need 
we need a couple of those lit holiday weekends to sort of figure out how things are going to go. Um, you're already seeing some of the beaches have reopened Hilton Head, South Carolina, Santa Barbara, California, posting pretty strong occupancy numbers. So I, I think there is going to be some fly to travel. It's just more of a result of there being such pent up demand. And we'll see how much of that is sustained and can start to build back our travel economy. I heard on the news this morning that anybody over the age of two would have to have a mask on at the beach. And having had three children, they're all a little older now, but uh, I cannot imagine a two or three year old running around the beach with a mask on. So good luck to those parents. If there is any bigger torture during pan the pandemic is having little kids during this and, and, and God bless those parents. Uh, Cause I don't know how they're going to do it. Another great and question. sunscreen. Cause that's going to leave quite a uh, tan line. Right. That's really funny. I didn't even think of that, right? Um, another great question. Uh, what is the most interesting interview you've had while reporting for Skift? God, Ooh, that is a good one. During this time, what a great time actually to be a hotel reporter. Um, you know, when we did last week or two weeks ago, uh, D. Taylor, he's the president of Unite Here, mm -hmm. big labor, uh, hospitality labor union in restaurants, hotels, casinos, and 98% of their more than 300,000 members have been laid off or furloughed in all of this. Um, and when I, I was discussing earlier all the tech advancements, I mean, it just really seems like there's such a labor story boiling mm -hmm. under the surface right now with hotels and that like there's, you're kind of pushing away from the need of a good chunk of your uh, payroll. And mm -hmm. it, it was really fascinating to hear. He actually sees some opportunities for the labor movement. Um, that might offset some of the tech advancements going on. So the, the need to clean every surface down, some hotel companies want it every 10 minutes, not even every hour. And so I, it, that's going to take staff. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's, it was really interesting to get his perspective and how he views what this could do to the labor movement. Mm -hmm. Someone I saw on Facebook was looking for one of those foggers. I wasn't even familiar with these foggers for their uh, Airbnb and their rental property. Is that something, I don't even know what that fogger is. Is It's a disinfecting fogger? Is that what yeah, they do in hotels? There are all sorts of interesting things. Like there's the disinfectant sprayer, there's a fogger, there's a UV um, cleaner going on. Airbnb is gonna be kind of the interesting one to watch because a lot of the bigger brands as they've rolled out all of these different standards of cleaning, mm -hmm. they think it's going to be an opportunity for them because people are going to value familiarity and want to book at a hotel rather than booking a stay at someone's house. Right. But Airbnb does have some interesting cleaning initiatives of their own, either buffer zones between booking. So the property gets a deep clean and then just stays dormant for at least a day, sometimes up to three between stays. So I didn't even we'll see. I, you know, Airbnb has taken up so much of the uh, the hospitality market. I didn't even think about the fact that now this is the opportunity for the hotels to pull that back to say, look, we're a trusted, you know, a trusted place to stay and you can trust what's happening here. And they've got controls that maybe you wouldn't know about in someone else's home. I hadn't even thought about that. That's a really great point. Um, now, speaking of not being able to go super far, the other thing that you had come out at the same time as the pandemic is your book, Moon Boston, yes. all about where to go and travel within Boston. <laughs> and so, Cameron, your timing is, is super interesting across the board here. Tell us about this book, why you wrote the book, and why actually it's a great time to buy it, particularly if you live in the New England area. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's publication day was Tuesday. It's um, maybe not the ideal time I would have chosen to release a book on hopping on a plane and coming to Boston from wherever you are, but still optimistic. Um, I, I've been working with Moon for several years now. I actually um, got the first one done before I actually worked at BizNow. And what it had been out for... A what was your um, it, it's Moon Moon Boston as well, but it was just volume one. And then this is the second edition. Um, okay. Because as, as we know, a couple of uh, restaurants in Boston are known to close here and there. So mm -hmm. after a couple of years, it's time to update and expand. It's an and updated version. It's not an, a plus one. It's, it's an updated version of the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so um, it, it's definitely, it, it was... It, 
we expanded out actually the P-Town section. We added um, kind of fortuitously actually a couple of outdoor walks so people can enjoy Boston without having to go into places, which I, I think is very advantageous for the current travel climate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, I, I think our the book is definitely more to appeal to the world travelers. I think now it's definitely a great resource for New Englanders or Bostonians to kind of reacclimate themselves with Boston and learn a little bit more about what's pretty close to home. And, you know, finally maybe go explore the freedom trail because you haven't done it ever. I've never or, done the freedom trail. I highly really recommend it. it I, I walked it, took photos, uh, all two and a half for the book and I, I actually got a kick out of it. And so it, it's, it's not as much of a tra Boston travel cliche as people would think. Where else would you suggest going? So, you know, I was thinking about this earlier when I travel and I travel a lot with my daughter actually. And whenever we travel, we catch a show in a different city. We always go to a museum. I'd had some of my favorite um, travel places here. We went to the Broad Museum, well, the Vatican, Australia, the Super Bowl, uh, but you know, LA to an architecture museum. You know, often going to all sorts of different places whenever I was in another city, but in Boston, I almost never go to a show. I never do the touristy um, freedom trail things. And, and this is actually a time that we could do it. It's beautiful out. We could just zip downtown, experience something new. Where else would I go other than the freedom trail? Yeah. Um, one of the walks I recommend is starting at South Station and doing the Harbor Walk. So you cross over Congress, you go by the Boston Tea Party Museum, which is still a great photo op, even if you can't go inside for a couple of days as well as the um, or a couple of weeks, as well as the Boston Children's Museum. But basically, you just hug the um, seaport coastline. And, and it's really neat because I think it's kind of that perfect blend of old and new Boston. Of mm -hmm. You get to see some of the older parts of downtown and then all the new glassy stuff uh, in the seaport. That's fun. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did some walks with in Back Bay, which is always great for architecture buffs. And you get to go along the Esplanade with the Charles River. And um, I actually got a significant- So if I was mm -hmm. walking this, you're talking about like, this is great for an architecture buff. I'm a huge architecture buff. Uh, do you describe the different areas? while I do. I'm walking yeah so we have a little bit of a guide of like in copley square where you have the the um the boston public library gosh okay. my <laughs> and, and facing the trinity church then the hancock tower i mean that's just kind of really three very different distinct styles mm -hmm. um of design and then you can walk out to the esplanade look across at the dome of mit and so you really get to see kind of just the collision of different design styles in Boston and all the Charles Bullfinch brown out, uh, brownstones, et cetera. Sure. Is it true, do you know, the John Hancock Tower, of course, is glass, very reflective glass. So when you're looking mm -hmm. up in the sky, it you know sort of blends with the sky because it's reflecting the sky. But I had heard and wondered if this was true. The reason it's so reflective is because it's next to the Trinity Church, which, of course, is one of the first most beautiful churches and right in the center of Copley Square in Boston. And it reflects the Trinity Church. So it's this very new, very modern next to this very old and very important. And is, is that why it's reflective like that? Do you know? It's partially that. And then also part of the design scheme is you have the old John Hancock building across the street from mm -hmm. 200 Clarendon, but what it want, that point was gonna be the new John Hancock Tower. And if you frame it right, you'll actually see the old John Hancock Tower uh, Hancock lobby essentially mm -hmm. perfectly centered in the base of 200 Clarendon, which is kind of cool. I had no idea that that was a very know. intended design scheme. I um, I ordered your book. I haven't received it yet. You know, funny Amazon's not doing overnight quite like they used to. <laughs> but, um, I ordered it, and so I can't wait to to go through it and actually go for a walk and and see all these things in my own hometown. Cameron, what else should we know before we wrap? I, I thank you so much for coming on today because everybody's dying to travel. Everybody's dying to, to I mean, I had to pull that suitcase out of the back of the car, <laughs> you know, because I sort of pushed it back there. I, I knew I wasn't going to be using it anytime soon. Um, but what do you want to leave us with? Something optimistic, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I mean my realistic dose of optimism is 
I don't think it's going to be a flip of a switch and we're going to be back to the way things were in 2019 in the next month or two. But I I think we're beginning to get an understanding of hopefully, knock on wood, uh, the Marriott CEO said the worst is kind of behind us, at least from what they're seeing. I hope that's true. Um, And as we sort of stabilize, the only way to go is up. And I I really Mm -hmm. think just hang in there, travel will come back, things are going to get lifted. I mean, we found out what on Monday, the steps that Massachusetts is taking, I think they're pretty smart steps to reopen. And if we're just patient a little bit longer, all our favorite spots are going to reopen. And I guess the, what I would kind of challenge everyone to do is just be sure to, once things reopen, support your local coffee shop, restaurant or hotel, et cetera, because they they really need our help right now. Sure. No, that's great. I really, again, I really appreciate you coming on. We're going to have to have you on again in a few months so you can give us the latest update. I feel like, um, I, I feel like there's so much more to learn and we really don't quite know what's around the, the next corner. And I give a lot of credit to the leadership of all the hotels trying to figure it out right now and make really smart investment decisions. So um, this is great. You've got the inside scoop. Thank you so much. Um, I, again, I'm waiting for my Moon Boston book to come in <laughs> side just that I love taking the time to explore uh, Boston yep and we popped it up too on the side and we have links I appreciate that yeah and we'll post it up for everyone and uh you know Cameron you, be sure to keep us updated too on what we need to know and what we need to be bringing to our viewers so so thank you so much I appreciate it yep and thanks Lisa uh, and then hopefully you'll be watching tomorrow too Cameron Tomorrow, we have Sarah Montana on, and I'm really excited about Sarah. She's a screenwriter for the Hallmark Channel. She writes the movies that we watch on Hallmark. And recently, she reached out to me because one of her upcoming leads is a PR woman. And we were helping, I was helping her shape the character. And so, Cameron, you can only imagine, we've worked together for many (laughs) years. I was helping her shape what this woman in PR would be like. And um, by no coincidence, uh, she ends up working with a, a tech CEO. And uh, so felt like I knew something about that. <laughs> but um, so she's on tomorrow, but she has a TED talk. And this is a really important part of what we'll be talking about. She has a TED talk about healing, forgiveness, and overcoming adversity. And I feel like there's a lot of those out there, but she has a unique story. When she was 22, she came home for Christmas and uh, someone broke into their home and killed her brother and mother six days before Christmas, and she was 22 years old. And she talks about her experience over the next decade of uh, pain and anger and people telling her to forgive. And it's not, it doesn't work that way. And she, she'll walk us through how we all have things that have happened to us that are traumatic and for different people, it's different levels, but how she did overcome this, how she did move her, her life forward. And how actually during this pandemic, we're all experiencing a little PTSD to traumatic things that have happened in our past. We have to say, oh, that's not then, this is now. But something changing so suddenly was something she even started to feel that anxiety because that's what had happened to her in the past, something changing very dramatically out of nowhere. And we were talking about how, you know, that's something that a lot of people can relate to, that they've had a trauma in their life that uh, changed them. And now with this, maybe they're starting to feel that anxiety again. And she talks through the steps to to working through these things and and moving forward with your life. So we're really excited to have Sarah on tomorrow. And I appreciate everybody, again, finding us live here on YouTube. Please share with your friends, subscribe, and uh, check out all the people that are coming on. You can set reminders. And Cameron, thanks again for being on today. And we'll see you all again tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.